Hey, how's it going everybody? This is Greg Brown from the Foundry and today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the Moto 10 series. Specifically, we're going to be talking about how Moto can be used alongside game engines such as Unity in the case of uh, this video and also our new procedural modeling system. Now when I say the Moto 10 series, I really need to clarify um, because as of Moto 10 we have a new development structure here at the Foundry. Um, what we're doing with Moto is instead of releasing one giant set of features once per year or once per you know uh, version release, we're actually releasing features during the course of a development cycle or a product cycle actually. And so the first release in the Moto 10 series was Moto 10.0 and that is our games release. Uh, we added a lot of really awesome games related features that also apply to areas outside of games. We'll talk about that a little bit today as well. And as of Moto 10.1, which just came out uh, just about a week ago or so, a uh, week or two, that is our procedural modeling release. And, you know, two things that people have been asking us for for quite some time is we want more games features and we want history-based modeling. And so in the, the first two releases during the Moto 10 series, we've addressed two of those issues. And the games tools are freaking awesome. The procedural modeling tools are also freaking awesome. And I'm going to show you a little bit having to do with those various components and how to cope with um, certain, I guess, workflows that you may want to take into account. All right, so what you're looking at right now is Moto 10, and we are actually in the game tools layout. And I'm going to take the opportunity to kind of walk you through this layout a little bit. Um, this is my new favorite layout. I've played around with building layouts on Moto in the past and, you know, made my own favorite layouts. Um, but now we have a layout that I just by default want to use and it's part of Moto 10. And so a couple cool things about it. Um, if you come on down to these buttons on the bottom, you have quick access to your modeling, brush, scene and setup tools, and the new games game tools menu, which is has a lot of awesome stuff for export, baking, and vertex map management and uh, manipulation. And also if you click on any of the actual toggled menus a second time you see they disappear. And so now the entire interface can be customized quickly and easily to be more viewport centric. And also along the bottom we have quick access to our timeline, our schematic view, UV view, and a preview window. This one is um, already organized for baking. If you want to use it for something outside of baking, um, you can just come up to this little gear widget or hit the O key inside your viewport, which that didn't work for me, so it's a gear widget. And uh, you'll notice that the render mode is set to bake, and that means it's going to actually show you a baked UV as to a final rendered image. Um, but this would be useful to you, um, especially if you start playing around with this, and you're like, hey, wait, why am I not getting a render? It's like, well, it's in bake mode, because we can now use our progressive renderer for baking. All right, now, for those of you who aren't aware, Moto has a layout switcher, and we have a new one as of 901, and this allows you to collapse or expand the layout switcher up here, and you still have access to the old specialized layouts for modeling topology, UVs, paint, etc. And, uh, you know, it's a great way of being able to learn the application, having these separate uh, layouts, and some people like using, you know, specific layouts. But I'm, I'm more of a cockpit kind of guy. I want to have as many tools as available to me as possible and this is a great, great layout for that. Um, we also, inside this new layout, have game navigation. And if I just click on this button right here, you end up with this game navigation panel that pops up. And you know what? I probably want to increase my speed so you can see as I hit the plus key on my keyboard, it highlights down there in the game navigation panel. And to speed that up a little bit, and now I'm using WASD style navigation to move around my viewport. And this is awesome because, I mean, even if you aren't a gamer or don't want WASD navigation, um, this style of navigation is much better for dealing with large scenes. Um, the standard style of navigation is more object centric so you can get around an object start manipulating it but game style navigation is all about being able to navigate very large environments and so it's very cool and there's also really neat features like uh, collision like right there I can't go any further and you can actually collide with objects and that's stuff that will only continue to go further so have a play with that it's lots and lots and lots of fun now, one of the things I didn't communicate um, about the Moto 
10.0 release, the games tools release, is it was a major upgrade to our advanced viewport. In 901, we released the advanced viewport, and as of 10, we made some major upgrades to that. Now, something important to communicate about this new viewport. The way we were building this viewport is much more analogous to a renderer of, you know, 10 years ago. Um, you know, there was a time when full-blown renderers were coming out with new feature after new feature after new feature. Moto was very much a part of that uh, in version 2 when the renderer was really released. I remember I was like so excited that we had um, you know, easy creation of um, image-based lighting, uh, spherical HDRs as environments, really quick and easy methods of doing that. Um, things like uh, micro-poly displacement or addition of subsurface scattering. Features were being tacked on incrementally to renderers. And now we're at a point where, yes, new features do come out, but renderers pretty much have what they need these days. And uh, it gets faster, gets prettier, gets clearer. Um, but those base features, generally speaking, are there. And so we started out with the base component that is our advanced viewport and we're continuing to add features and this is going to going to continue to happen um, with each you know major release of Modo. We had this major addition in 10 and we'll see some pretty cool stuff in future versions. I'm, I'm absolutely certain. So a couple things about this viewport, things that we added. We added image-based lighting, and so this scene is actually being lit by the spherical HDR that you see here, both the spherical HDR and also direct lighting, so I've got a uh, directional light in here as well. And if I come over to the gear icon and I click on that, or I hit the O key inside my viewport while it's active and come over to the advanced options, there's a couple options worth talking about. So as of 10, um, you know, we added the ability to have screen space reflections. This is probably on by default. Um, it looks great. You won't see much of any difference in this scene because there really aren't any um, highly reflective objects that make this ob uh, obvious. But fast basically doesn't turn on uh, um, blurry reflections for your scene-based reflections. Um, and if you turn that over to blurry, blurry will actually use the material roughness to blur the scene-based reflections as well. That's generally much slower and fast, well generally speaking is fast, um, it definitely is adding you know uh, more weight to the scene in general. If you have a very heavy scene with a lot, a lot, a lot of objects uh, reflecting it can slow things down. So generally speaking I have that off just to let you know. Anti-aliasing, um, you know you can turn that up to 3x, things look absolutely gorgeous. Um, I actually find I leave that on by accident a lot, but it's a nice way also of being able to recover some performance. Um, and to talk a little bit about the way your lighting is happening in the scene. You see as I move around my object, my shadows are static. Now if I pop on in here into the advanced um, options, right now my lighting is set to scene plus environment. So my scene direct lighting is affecting the, uh, the viewport and my environment lighting is affecting the viewport. Now if I come over to default viewport you can see right now I'm actually just getting um, direct lighting from the viewport lights because um, the shadows are moving around as you can see depending upon where I look at this. Viewports have lights associated with them and so in this case I believe this viewport has two lights and this is much better for modeling things of that sort because your shadows move according to where your camera is located and uh, if I hop on over here into the advanced options and I switch on over to say for instance scene um, right now I am only getting my lighting from my direct lights but the scene direct lights and you can see right now that that, um, I have stato uh, shadows that are not moving. And if I come on again over, I'll also toggle this on by the way because you can just go ahead and click right there in that circle to lock a panel in place so it's always available to you while, you're, well, while you want it to be. And if I come over to environment, now my scene is only being lit by my environment. And again, scene plus environment I get both. And so these are important things to consider. Also, I have show lights turned off. This will affect whether or not whether or not your lights are showing according to these lighting options. My background is set to environment. If I set that to default viewport, it's just going to go to the default background for that viewport. And uh, just important to understand that difference right there. And display override. Uh, display override is really for, you know, doing like a play blast or something like that. And you can actually turn off 
visibility of the widgets and buttons and stuff like that in the viewport so you can do a, a nice clean perfect play blast so hopefully that helps you understand a little bit more about the options behind the advanced viewport Another thing I frequently do just to recover a little bit of performance is turn off shadows. Um, it really doesn't have all that negative of an effect performance wise, but it is important to understand um, you know, where these things are, how to turn them off and on, and be able to recover performance. Because we have this beautiful, beautiful viewport. We want you to be able to interact with it smoothly and cleanly. All right, so we talked about the viewport a little bit. Um, let's talk about some of the other things that were technically added to the viewport, but also added to other components of the program. So what you're looking at right now is a scene that I want to bring into Unity. And if I come over to my shader tree, and I expand any of my materials, you'll notice that inside of my material groups, I have a Unity material, which you can see expressed down here, and um, effects or channels that are assigned to the relative effects. So these textures are affecting my objects. Turn those off, they'll disappear, turn, turn them on, they'll come back. So this is the actual Unity shader inside of Modo's viewport, which is extremely cool. Uh, one of the first things we wanted to do we started playing around with this new games release is we wanted, we wanted to make sure that people are capable of working in context. There is nothing more important than that in the modern age, I guess, with all the wonderful technology that we have. We have the ability to actually be able to see in our DCC app that is Modo, the same things that you would see in a game engine such as Unity. And we did a very good job of developing custom shaders for both Unity and Unreal that look beautiful in the viewport. Now, beyond that, um, right now I have five separate scenes open. I'm in my island scene. and I'm going to turn off my secondary scenes. This is something that's really cool about Modo. This has been around since Modo started. The ability to have multiple scenes open simultaneously, turn on the visibility of uh, inactive scenes in the background. And what's really cool about that is when I turn those on, those scenes, even though they have their own distinct lighting, they adopt the lighting from the master scene. And so this lets you really, again, um, not only work in context, but also be able to work in high res in context. And what I mean by that is you start off with a basic you know, component of the, the scene, the level, whatever you want to you want to create. And maybe I started sculpting these rocks. I did not sculpt these rocks. I bought them on the Unity store. This would have taken me for ever to, to sculpt and model these rocks. So instead I, I bought them and it served as a really good test to be able to see how assets from the Unity store looked in our new viewport. And they look absolutely gorgeous. But they don't just look gorgeous in the viewport. If I hit F8 to pop up our preview renderer, which is our render in a progressive state, even though this scene is, and the objects in the scene are using the Unity shader, they actually render. And this is also true in Unreal, which this is really freaking cool that you, you not only can use these, these new shaders, um, you know, in the viewport and, you know, to send off to a game engine, but you can actually see them in render. And so this offers different shading workflows inside of Modo while still using the same exact render. So very useful to people who are not involved in games. Maybe you prefer a metalness workflow for creating textures. Well, that's now available to you as, as a Moto 10. All right, so if I turn on my wireframe, you can see that I've got multiple objects in this scene, right? These are the rocks that I brought in from Unity. And I just, you know, brought in the original rocks and then instanced them all over the place. That's what the purple items are. And of course, I can interact with these. What if I want to start manipulating things? I could turn on my background objects and start tweaking and tuning. By the way, in case you don't know, if you hold down the control key like I am right now while you're using the rotate tool, you will get automatic snapping to predefined angles. And so Y key, just to show you that, um, coming to the snapping panel right here, you hold down the alt key and you are able to expand the options for snapping. Right now, my snapping angle is 15 degrees. I could set that to be 30 degrees if I wanted to, and it will snap to 30 degree increments instead. And this is one of those things that's extremely, extremely useful as far as being able to interact with the application. All right, and you know what else? I'm also not happy with the location um, for this object where the, um, the center or pivot of this object is located. So let's modify that really quickly. Um, that is done underneath item mode. So I'm gonna right click on this, come down to center, click on center instead, and you see you end up with these axes.
axes that are displayed to you. And you click in the center on that little white circle, it turns orange. And now I can hit the W key and I can now start to manipulate how that item is actually centered. But wait, nothing is happening. Why is nothing happening, right? Well, the reason why is because this is an instance. I can't change the center of my instance. And the reason for that is its source item has a center that is identical, and I can't change that from the original source item. So if I wanted to actually find that object, the source of this instance, I can come into my item list. I can right click on top of it. And you know what? Let's go ahead and select source of instance. Now I have that instance item selected. And I could go ahead and maybe move that one item on out. I don't want it to be into center mode. I want that to be in item mode momentarily. Move this on over. You can see, don't like my center. Right click on top of that, center, click on that. Go ahead and change that around. You see all these different items throughout my scene actually shift and change according to that. Um, this is useful though, because I do want to be able to actually modify the center of my items. Um, but this kind of articulates an important point of how you actually um, set the pivot for an actual item and the effect that may have on you know, scenes that actually contain a high level of instancing. All right, so I'm going to undo. Now, why did I do it this way? Because this is really, really an inefficient way of um, throwing geometry in an engine. These are instances, but typically when you, when you actually send stuff like this over to an engine, it would all be essentially flattened into one very, very large mesh object and be very, very inefficient for that reason. Well, um, as of 10.0, we added awesome options to our uh, export tools. And so now you can actually export instances along with FBX. Um, we added support to FBX 2015. And so you can see right here, tells you the various versions you can set your, your export options to. At the top where it says use latest, that means FBX 2015, just to let you know, one of those important things to clarify. Now in the games tools uh, layout underneath the export options, we have this whole new panel. Um, lots of new options for FBX export, things like triangulation of geometry, um, export of PBR materials. We actually export a sidecar XML file that um, can be sent over to a game engine like Unity and Unreal. And there are plugins for each of those that will load up textures from your scene um, based on what the information that is in that XML file. So really, really cool way of being able to interact smoothly and easily with a game engine and game presets for Unreal Engine and Unity. And you can also create a new preset and store presets for export, say if you wanted to create a preset for CryEngine or something like that. All right, so very cool. I want to export all the items right here in this scene not my secondary scenes, but just this scene, over to Unity. And I want it to maintain my instances and want to be able to continue manipulating it once I get into Unity. Um, so first off, let me just hop on over into Unity. One of the first things that we're going to need to do. Here's the basic scene. You know what? I need to find um, where my assets are located. And so I can just right click inside the browser, show and explore. You know what? I want to go into my assets folder. I can copy my address, and then I can pop back on over into Modo and drop that into my output directory so that I have everything set up properly. All right, um, you can go ahead and cycle through the various options here. We have support for export of the correct tangent basis, things of that sort. Uh, makes life nice and easy. But all we have to do now is just say, you know what, I think I'm done. I'm gonna go ahead and say, hey, export Modo, and pop on over into Unity. And you can see right now Unity is actually loading up my FBX file. And because of the plugin that is located inside the editor fo folder, the Moda Material Importer, um, it's automatically importing my materials along with it. And my asset is right down here. And if I drag and drop that into the viewport, you can see we have a beautiful asset in our scene. I also bothered to add the same HDR to get something that's somewhat analogous. Um, but the really cool thing is if we hop on over into the hierarchy over here, um, this is a prefab. And if I expand, I've got all my individual instances, my original master objects, and I can continue manipulating the, those, those items individually. And so this is really cool. This you know allows for you to use 
a DCC app like Moto as much more of an editor, which I'm much more comfortable with. I want to spend as much time as possible in a single application, especially during the art creation uh, process. And so really, really cool that you're able to interact in this way with both Unity and Unreal. I believe this is um, improved support for this type of uh, interaction, including instances uh, came in 4.12. Um, not 100% about that with, with Unreal, um, but apparently the workflow for that has improved considerably. One of those things I want to want and need to play around with a lot more. All right, so very, very cool. Great example of how you can exchange stuff back and forth with your game engine smoothly and easily. Now let's pop on over into this block scene. You can see that I've got this secondary scene that I, you know, um, has all these bricks and blocks all over the place, and all these are instances. And in fact, I was very lazy about it. These will be sculpted uh, eventually. These source items are right up here. Just wanted to make sure they were in view so we can start messing around with them. Now, Moto has lots of really great tools for dealing with lots of objects really, really well. And so in the case of like this tower, I've got this floating pathway coming into a tree that has a what was going to be a lighthouse growing out of it. There may have been a little bit of drinking involved that day. I have no comment on that. Um, but if I select one of my instance items, turn on wireframe, you can see that they're all purple. Now let me find out where in my item list everything is located. I'm just going to select that one at the top and then shift select that one at the bottom. And now, as you can see in the lower right hand corner, I have 406 items selected. Now, I want to start manipulating these blocks, um, but I want to manipulate them um, all together at once using kind of brush based tools. I don't want to have to hand place and select every single freaking item. And to do that, I can come over into my modeling menu, come into deform, grab the soft drag tool. You'll notice that when I grab the soft drag tool, it automatically sets um, a screen based fall off. And right now, I am my action center is set to local. Now, remember, um, all these items, these bricks are all individual instanced items. Each one has its own center. And what we want to manipulate is the position of that item, not the components that make up the item, not the vertices, edges, or polygons. We just want to move those objects around. And if I go ahead and I drag out my soft drag tool, while my action center is local, right? This means that I'm going to have a local, a uh, custom local action center for each individual object. Things get a little bit wacky. I can go ahead and start dragging left or right here in the viewport and you see how all my, my bricks are going off in a specific but definitely unintended direction. So pretty good for making things look like they're blowing up, right? And the reason for that is, of course, each of those have their own action center and are going off relative to, to their local axes. If I click on the action center and I say, you know what, I want this to be screen as well, now the center um, for every object I manipulate, it's going to be based on screen space. And in this way, what I can do is I can go ahead and then left click and drag and start tweaking and tuning this tower to make it look more like it's crumbling and falling. Because, you know, down here I ran a, a, a basic simulation to drop a whole bunch of bricks and blocks into place. And this tower up here, it, you know, it looks like an artist intends for it to look like it's crumbling, but it doesn't really look like it's crumbling. And being able to use these brush-based tools in this way really helps. Of course, I can turn my wireframe off if I want to, maybe come over to this bridge over here, make it look like it's sinking. But remember, I'm not manipulating the geometry. I'm manipulating the location of the actual items, individual items themselves. 400 items all at once, which is really freaking cool. Sorry, my geek out over things like this every day. All right, so interesting tool, interesting usage of it. Let's talk about some other really cool tools as well. And so if I come on over into another one of my scenes, in this case, the trunk. No, actually, I don't want the trunk. I want the vines and leaves frozen. Notice that the lighting and shading is completely different, um, even when I turn on my background objects. Um, I want to play around with my vines and my leaves, right? And so what I want to do is not play around with necessarily the actual original ivy items. I want to play around with the vines themselves. These have all been merged, which is um, <laughs> going to be interesting to say the least. Um, but what I want to do is I want to play around with uh, some of the UV tools that are added in 901. So I'm going to select this one vine right there. Or actually, 
let's go ahead and uh, select a couple of these. Um, typically, I, I have this all frozen. These were replicators. The, the actual leaves were created replicating um, over the surface. And, uh, you know, typically I'd have those on separate layers. And I could grab every single one of these vines super quickly and easily. But I'm going to hit Shift H to hide those on OA. And, uh, oh, there's my replicator items. So I do have that. All right. Let's go ahead and select every single freaking vine. And so, well, except for the ones there at the bottom. You can see I've got lots and lots of vines selected. Now, um, if I came into work in the morning and somebody told me, hey, I need you to UV 40,000 polys that you know actually can make up these you know 50 or so individual vines I you know I, I, I might consider possibly maybe walking out um, but let's pop up the UV view and take a look at what we have here um, underneath the list tab that's where you will find your UV maps and there we go I've got all these overlapping UVs but they look really square right now if I want to underneath the UV tools I can select the edges that were used to unwrap these items. And so select select UV border, and that's just going to make my life easier. Um, and now I've selected all the edges associated with this. And now let's run an unwrap across all those vines. And so I'm just going to left click and drag once. And that's probably what you're accustomed to seeing in a lot of applications when you unwrap items such as this. Um, basically a bunch of squiggly, squiggly lines. Now what I can do though is as of 901, I can with Basically, when nothing is selected, everything is selected in that layer. I can come over to Rectangle, and I can tell it I want UV Rectangle, and I want you to pack it as well. And so what it's actually doing is it's rectangularizing all my individual vines simultaneously and packing them together. And so this is you know, one of those, those UV tools that doesn't just save you know a minute or two. It saves hours if you have lots and lots of objects. Um, I mean, if you're making a level that has a whole bunch of pipes or things of that sort, this is going to be a freaking lifesaver. And uh, it is, all spans are correctly organized based on the actual um, surfaces themselves. And because they're not quite oriented the way I want them to, they're a little bit funky. Um, but you can also um, come on up to you know what, I want to pack my UVs. I want to orient them, but I want to orient them. Um, now let's go with vertically. You can tell Modo essentially how you want to organize a whole bunch of individual UV islands very quickly and very easily. Um, you also can tell it not to, not to scale your items too, which in this case may have been useful. Um, but I'll just go ahead and let it run this pack. Um, but again, yeah, this is one I'd love to show off just because of how tremendously, tremendously useful it is. And I'll go ahead and scale this on up. So maybe we have textures that look a little bit better. And keep on going and keep on going. All right, so much better. Not entirely happy with that, but great, great, great UV tool that definitely wanted to show off to you guys. Now let's hop on over into my gargoyle scene. Uh, this is one that I really enjoy playing around with. This gargoyle is actually, if I turn off my secondary scenes, is a 6 million polygon gargoyle. Now I'm in the low poly version of him right now. I have baked out um, uh, the basic diffuse texture and also a normal map um, from this high poly variant. And what's really cool about this, um, in the case of the high poly model, everything, this whole model from scratch was created inside a Moto. We used the modeling tools, the sculpting tools, mesh fusion even. I built it out as separate body parts and then merged those get together, retopoed, and then baked from there. Kind of an interesting workflow. I don't have time to go into it here. Um, but Moto is very flexible. You can do a lot of different stuff in the application. Um, but I wanted to kind of show off that, say for instance, I throw on my island scene. And you know what? I definitely need my bricks and blocks in this case, which will hide my gargoyle. I'm going to go ahead and instance this gargoyle, who is a 6 million polygon sculptable multi-resolution mesh. And I'm going to start moving around in the scene. And so since I'm moving this instance in item mode, that gives me a lot of flexibility as far as being able to maintain performance. And you know what? I'm going to have him look kind of, um, well, not look the direction I want him to look, but just so we get slightly better lighting. You can see the interaction is freaking phenomenal. And this is one of those opportunities I really like to show off the uh, Moto's ability to create 
systems, systems that aid you in the current task at hand. And so if I come on up to the viewport up here, click on that little arrow that points to the right, and I come over to viewport controls, and I want to duplicate that, I now have two viewports. These viewports are decoupled. If I click on the gear icon or hit O in the viewport, underneath drawing control, you'll see independent center, scale, and rotate are toggled on. And so if I turn those off, you'll see that we end up with um, something that orients much more closely. These two would be absolutely perfectly linked if I had all those on. Um, but then I can also hop in there, come over to inactive meshes and say, hey, make inactive meshes invisible. And uh, at this point, I can start playing around with my source mesh in the scene with far fewer items showing and also see my, my scene as a whole over in this view, which is very, very cool. So, you know, in this view, I've got 11 million polys. Over here, it says I've got about the same, um, but it's going to perform much differently because I have far fewer items showing. Now, if I select that original source item and I come over to my brush tools and say, for instance, my push brush, and I left click and drag once, probably want to take a look at them over here in this viewport a little bit differently. And there we go. I'm going to start sculpting away on top of this. Um, the renderer or the viewport is a deferred renderer. And so you actually, um, just by separating components of a scene out like this, you can actually recover a lot of performance because you're only interacting or, or seeing a limited um, kind of subset of objects in this left viewport, and you're seeing everything over here. And so it allows you to deal with much more complex scenes, much more smoothly, much more easily. And I'm not sure what I just did to them, gave them some kind of terrible, awful disease. Um, but, you know, I really wish undo existed in the real world. Funny story, the first time I realized I should just just become a 3D artist, I was going to art school and I was working on a drawing in my apartment and I made a mistake. And my first instinct wasn't erase or try and fix it. My, my instinct was, you know, control Z. First thought that popped into my head was control Z. At that point, gave up and went towards, um, you know, uh, CG as, as a career. All right, so a couple other really cool things about this. We're going to go on and bake this character in just a bit. But I'm going to turn off my secondary scenes for now, and I'm going to delete my gargoyle. Yes, to all. Go away, instance gargoyle. You are no longer needed. So if I come over to my low poly, gargoyle and I come up to my shader tree since we are going to be baking them you know what I want to do I want to go ahead and turn that off I'm gonna delete it just because it looked pretty and I'm going to select this image and come on over to underneath my brush tools utilities and I'm gonna clear that image and if I come into card norm I'm going to clear that image as well. So no, I no longer have a diffuse map or a normal map on my character. And I'm going to toggle those off temporarily. Um, and I'm also going to get rid of this isolated view. And to do that, just say delete. There we go. Um, another thing to point out that I just did, and this is one of those that I find people are surprised about, um, and it's hugely, hugely useful. If you'll notice, my scene currently only has my gargoyle and a camera um, visible in the viewport. If I hit the A key, it will center on all items that are visible in the viewport. A camera is an item, so it includes that. So A key, let's go ahead. A key centers on all items. And if I were to come on into visibility and turn on show lights, it would take the light into account too. All right, and same thing with locators, all, all, all sorts of items in the scene. Now, I do currently have my gargoyle selected. And so if I hit Shift plus A, it's going to center on my selected item. And that, of course, is true if I select the camera, for instance. Now, if I hit Control Shift A, it's going to align to the average normal of the surface. Um, this is actually kind of what happens when you're doing a UV unwrap and you, you, you tell it to use, uh, oh wow, totally blanking on that right now. So model UV unwrap tool and use the uh, oops excuse me initial projection of group normal it's basically averaging the normals of your entire surface this is how it decides where it begins to unwrap from in the same way and so it's it's zooming in or centering based on the 
average normal. Now this also applies to your selections. And so if I have a selection and I hit Control Shift A, you see it aligned to the average normal of that surface. But if I just hit Shift A, it's just going to zoom in based on my current view. These are important things to understand uh, as far as interacting with the application. All right. Um, now let's actually pop on over into our vertex map view. And so what I want to play around with is vertex map painting, another great new component of the uh, of 10.0. Now you can access this underneath the brush tools and paint tools. And if I come on over into my, or excuse me, vertex map, paint tools, not paint tools. And if I come on over into my list tab over here where all my vertex maps are located, what I want to do is I want to create a, a vertex color map. And so, okay, I want the initial color to be, let's, uh, let's go with white. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and fill that entire surface with white. And so now we have a vertex color map listed underneath other maps, and we can paint on that. And so when I grab the paintbrush, click in the viewport, a whole bunch of new options show up. I can set my color, et cetera, and I can paint color on the surface. It's really, really freaking fast. Not exactly a hugely high poly model, but it is fast. Now I painted red on the surface right here, right? Now what if I turn off the channel mask options of R and G for red and green, and then I continue painting? Well, you can see that I get a very, very different effect color-wise, and then that's because you can now choose which channels you are painting to into um, as a whole. Now, also, if I come on over here, what if I go ahead and I undo that? There's a bunch of other really cool aspects to this, things I wasn't really familiar with before. Um, turns out that falloffs have falloffs I've never used prior to um, playing around with this tool, and specifically, there's a curvature falloff. So, what if I wanted to do like a really quick you know, ambient occlusion, or quick occlusion type effect on this. Um, one of those things I commonly hear about from artists uh, in games is using vertex maps to kind of just punch up a texture. Like, great, a uh, great example of that would be um, adding an occlusion to uh, um, a textured object through vertex maps because you don't really need the resolution. And I'll go ahead and change my color on down to black. And now, as you can see, I can paint on that surface probably actually want to set my value instead or you know what I'll paint this I'll zoom on out make a huge brush set that to none and 100% I don't want to mess around I want 100% black there we go so now I've got black painted over my whole model turn that wireframe off change that over to white and turn my fall off on, which is my curvature base fall off. And now I can go ahead and just paint that in on the surface. And it's a little bit chunky, um, but you know it's acceptable considering it is a vertex map. Um, and thank you for auto saving Moto. But then I can hop on over, grab the smooth brush, and just start smoothing that into the surface so I have something that looks a little bit more natural. Um, but very, very cool ways of being able to interact with vertex maps currently. Absolutely love this stuff. All right, so now let's come on back out of the vertex map mode and come into advanced mode. And let's talk a little bit about baking. Um, James Dar uh, Darknail is actually working on a tutorial series right now. You guys will be seeing that soon-ish. Um, he's been working his butt off on it. And he uses the new bake wizard. And if I come over to the games tools, and the baking section, you can see there's a bake wizard. And this bake wizard will walk you through setting up a bake. So it's, it's a bake wizard. Uh, but there's also a texture bake item, which you can add right here. And the texture bake item is great for setting up a persistent bake. And what I mean by that is when you set up a relationship between a target and a source mesh and what outputs you want to be baked, that is persistent. That stays consistent as you continue working in your scene. Moto has had awesome baking technology for years, um, but the workflow has always been obtuse. And so as of 10, we added a completely new, couple new baking workflows that make life a lot easier. All right, so the texture bake item, when you add it from the new texture bake item command over here, um, it shows underneath, shows up underneath bake items inside the shader tree, and you set your target meshes. This um, is actually the, the mesh you want to bake to. The source meshes, the meshes you want to bake 
from and your texture outputs, which right now are mixed. If you have a texture selected and the texture bake item is also active, um, you can actually add or remove a texture quickly and easily. And so if I go ahead and select that, come over to my texture bake item, you see you get this add selected option. So if I select the mesh, I'll have the option to add that to target a source. Select texture items, you can add that to texture outputs. Um, I have a cage already added um, to this character, and so it's set to use that cage, and I want to bake from source. Um, also, currently my high poly gargoyle is hidden, and what I want to do is I want to be able to bake from that uh, using that, that high poly gargoyle, but I don't want it to be visible because I want to instantly be able to see the result, not have to hop back into the item list and turn it off. And so these options are extremely useful. And so if I come on back on over into the shader tree, just because I, I, that's, that's what I do, um, I'm going to go ahead and select these items. I'll turn on their visibility, and I'm going to bake all my textures. And so right now what's going on is this is actually batch baking both my normal for my object and also my actual texture. Now once this is done I'll be able to show you uh, you know some other components that you really need to pay attention to when baking. All right, so now we're all done, and you can see that it has already applied my diffuse texture and also my uh, my normal, and so pretty freaking awesome. All right, so another important thing to talk about is tangent basis maps and also normal maps or vertex normal maps. Uh, these are two things that have a tremendous, and I mean tremendous, impact. On, on baking. Um, this is one of those things that when we talk about games tools, this was one of the key components as far as our ability to exchange cleanly and easily with game engines. And so if I pop on over into my drive, and you know what, I want to open up my pulse rifle. And so go ahead and find my pulse rifle. Yay, yay, yay. And open that up. Uh, this is a pretty solid example of the vertex map tools, which is essentially the addition of uh, Farfarer's vertex normal toolkit, um, but in Moto proper, and also the ability to set tangent bases specific to game engines. Now this asset um, is configured for Unreal, and as you can see down here, I'm using the Unreal material. You can use the uh, bake item to bake to Unreal or Unity materials, of course. And it's a nice model. Um, I, you know, I'll pat myself on the back for that, but it's a nice model because I used a smart and very skilled artist techniques in constructing it, um, an artist named Tor Frick. And if I turn my wireframe on, you can see that this mesh is a lot of very awkward, very long triangles. However, when you don't look at it in this way, uh, or with wireframe on, it almost looks like a sub-D item. And the reason for that is really intelligent modeling methods using Booleans and the um, setting custom vertex normals to control how your, your surface is actually smoothing. And so if I turn off all my materials here, I can even turn off the Unreal material and go to the base one. Um, here's what it looks like without any textures. I've got lots of hard edges right here. And I do want to have my Unreal material and my Unreal normal in place if I want to be able to show you the nice rounded edges that are happening right there. All right. Oh, I forgot, didn't I? I forgot to tell you that other really important thing about baking and the bake item. Um, the edge expansion. Um, oh, boy. Yeah. Should I backtrack? Pause. When you're baking, you need to make sure that you have an edge border distance or um, basically an edge bleed distance around your UV islands. If I go ahead and I open up my one of my UVs for this item right here, this is an island. Moto has great selection tools. If I just double click on polys associated with an island in the UV view, um, you can see it actually automatically selects only the polys associated with that island. Now if I turn on, for instance, my Unreal Normal, and I pop on over here, and you know, I actually tell it, you know what, I want to see my image, which I'll have to actually select it to be able to see it. 
and I zoom on in here, you can see I've got actually a nice border around my actual UVs themselves. I'll have to come back here so it, it applies. There's an actually, actually a nice distance here. You need a, a pretty broad distance. Now if I come over to System Preferences and I come on down to Rendering because our render is what is used um, for our baking, you can see there's Bake UV Border Size and I had it set at 3 and it looked okay won't necessarily when you go into the game engine and uh, one of those really interesting tidbits I got from from James O'Hare otherwise known as Farfair is just throw it up really high like 32 or 64 um, obscenely high and what you'll notice is that when two big borders cross each other they basically split the difference they just stop right in the middle right where they cross and so go ahead and set that big UV border really really high um, by default and it'll make your life a lot lot easier all right so back to the rounded corners see I've got these nice rounded corners on here and really on this mesh the only thing that gives it away is not being a sub D item is the lack of rounded edges or bevels um, especially on those surfaces could have edge weighting whatever um, but that's really what gives it away now if I come over into my material properties for my actual moto material I come down to, the, down to the bottom there's a rounded edge width option and it's based on distance and so I'm going to set it at one millimeter if I turn on the preview render or progressive render I almost don't want to call it the preview render anymore because it's just I mean it's pretty much what I use all the time I very rarely use the bucket render anymore um, except for baking um, you can see that I've got this nice rounded edge, nice little bevel on my surfaces, even though they're actually hard edges. And so what it's doing is it's automatically finding um, edges that ha are of a certain angle and applying a rounding to that. Now what Torfric realized that nobody else seemed to realize um, was that this is entirely bakeable. And so you can actually bake this down to a normal map and capture that information. And so it allows me to create a mesh that is actually looks highly detailed. It's 34,000 polys, which is kind of, you know, getting close to the upper limit that you'd want for a weapon like this, but I was kind of thinking about it, you know, something more like uh, for Unreal Tournament or something like that. And so able to actually create an extremely detailed weapon very efficiently. And I can even use kind of hybrid baking workflows that let me go ahead and capture information like my bump detail and then also capture um, the rounded edge width stuff to be able to really make something that looks like it's finely nuanced. And so rounded edge shader in Moto, extremely, extremely freaking cool. Absolutely love this thing. All right. Now, being able to set your vertex normals um, on a mesh like this is absolutely key. On that gargoyle I showed before, um, I just through my smoothing up to like 180 degrees or so and 100% smoothing. Now uh, if I hop on over into my list view here and we take a look at my normal maps, I've got this FBX normal uh, vertex map right here, I'm going to go ahead and just delete that. Yeah, go ahead, get rid of it. Now not much changed there, but if I pop on down into my actual material settings themselves and turn off the Unreal material, come over to the properties, and come on down to my smoothing. I'm going to throw that up to 180 degrees. And you can see, yeah, that's the nightmare that you want to avoid. All this shading that shows stretching. This is just going to almost definitely introduce artifacts on a hard surface mesh like this um, if you try and bake it. So if I come over to my vertex map tools, um, this is where the vertex normal toolkit is now um, uh, has been added. And I come into the list tab. You'll notice that I have these edge pick maps. Now when I went through the process of setting my hardened edges, I would select a couple edges. Right now this mesh is triangulated, which makes that a little bit harder. And you just click right on up here at Harden Selected Edges, and that hardens those edges. It actually applies it throughout your whole mesh, um, and you can continue going through there and hardening edges. And you'll notice that it creates a vertex normal map for me. Um, but I've got these edge pick maps here. Um, these edge pick maps, even though I got rid of my vertex normal map, um, are uh, basically recording the edges I select when I work with this. And so you can access that here in the vertex normal toolkit just by clicking on that button right here. And it's automatically going to select all the edges associated with your edge pick maps. And so those are all the edges that I had manually hardened. And if I harden those and click on them, 
they look absolutely gorgeous. Now the other advantage to this is say your selection is dropped, you click on that to get your, your edges back, this is going to make UVs a lot, lot easier. Um, when you have hardened edges, you want to make sure those hardened edges are the outside of a UV island. It's just going to produce a much cleaner normal bake. And so this allows you to source that information as the beginning of your unwrap. And so, I mean, taking a look at all these edges here, I'm sure you can imagine how much more painful it would be without that. And also just another little uh, trick that I find hugely useful, and that is select sharp. This lets you select by minimum and maximum angle, and you can see that's not using the edge pick maps, and it just goes ahead and selects my um, edges by angle. And so on hard surface meshes, great first step in being able to make sure that you uh, um, are, uh, make sure, or to just select all the edges that you need for unwrap or hardening, whatever. So very, very cool stuff. All right, so now let's take a look at another scene and we're going to move on over into sort of another topic. There's more things to talk about games wise, but hopefully we'll have some more time in the future to go over some of those things. But I want to talk a little bit about the new procedural modeling stuff uh, just because it is freaking incredibly, absolutely amazingly awesome. So I'm going to track down really quickly my uh, missing files. Um, this is actually kind of useful particularly on Windows. Um, I have my content folder underneath quick access. I can, um, and when you, you know, search for an image, it's going to be in the file name. And so if you know sort of where it is, like if it's in the content directory, you just come over to content, select your file name, drop that in search, and there you go. And it's going to automatically find all the other good stuff that we also need for you automatically. So that makes life a little bit easy, easier. All right, so here's a basic teacup. And uh, this teacup was modeled. Procedurally, I'm going to turn on my wireframe here, and what this is actually composed of is four procedural meshes. I'm going to get rid of the spoon because I dislike that spoon. And uh, if I say, for instance, decide I want to play around with my cup, what I want to do is I want to come over into the procedural modeling menu. If you're in the game tools layout and you want to have the procedural modeling palette here, I'm going to go ahead and delete that because it's not included in the game tools layout by default. You can just come on over here to these tabs, click the plus sign next to them, come down to data lists or data lists or data lists um, and click on procedural. And now you have the procedural palette right here. Now it shows up at the end so it may fall off um, and you know may not show up for you. You can left click and you can drag and drop this into place. Um, now this is basic viewport editing. If you screw it up doing this, you can just come up to layout and restore and it will restore your current layout. And you also can lock thumb dragging and lock divider dragging to keep you from being able to say, for instance, pull something off and having to put it back in place as you see here. So those things may be kind of useful to you. I don't know. All right, so my cup selected. And you'll notice that in this procedural palette down here underneath cup, I have all these various procedural operations. And if I were to toggle these off, you can see that each one of these is a modeling operation. That starts off with the merge mesh. And so if I come all the way down here to the merge mesh, this is the um, item, that the procedural item that merges a mesh from a separate object. So let's start there. Now, the procedural modeling tools have a lot of additional uh, you know, components that you're going to want to familiar yourself familiarize familiarize yourself with. Wow. Um, and underneath merge meshes, you can see that I have the sources drop down. Underneath that, I have my source circle, and I could I could delete it or I could switch it just by clicking right here on those uh, two horizontal arrows pointing in opposite directions. And then you have access to um, you know the other meshes that could be used as a um, source for a merge mesh. And all that is uh, in this case. If I come back over to my cup, is that one single poly right here. And if I hit the W key, I can't do anything, can I? And that's because I'm in my procedural mesh item. So if you start trying to use standard modeling tools, like I hit Shift plus B for bevel, nothing's going to happen because this is an entirely procedural mesh. However, the origin meshes that they are sourced from um, you know, can, can be manipulated. And so if I come on over into my source circle item, you can see it's actually located 
just below. And now I can continue manipulating that one item. And I probably don't want to have my curvature on. There we go. And so as I start manipulating this, you can see that it actually affects the, um, the actual plate as well as the actual cup. And the reason for that is they're both using a merge mesh that is then being manipulated to create two separate objects, a plate and a cup. Now, I turned on that whole stack. Now, what if I turn on ghost mode? And if I turn on ghost mode and come into the actual cup and maybe start down here at the bottom, hitting G turns on that ghost mode and it'll show future operations as ghosted. As I'm coming through here, it's like, hey, I want to thicken this. I want to bevel it a second time. Bevel, bevel, bevel. And there's a lot of different ways of being able to manage your selections. Like right here, um, if I select my select by index, it'll show you that these are the polys that were selected as part of this operation. Um, but, you know, there are many different ways of being able to manage your selections. If I come on over here and I turn on locator visibility, um, some of these operations are actually using a locator to decide where it's going to be. Um, you know, deleting um, things of that sort or manipulating a, an actual mesh. So as a selection operation, you aren't limited to select by index. You also can go ahead and use a new selection operation like select by border, fall off, index, range, selection set, or polygon. And so just to kind of show you the way this looks with the various fall offs that are also being used as selection operators. I'll turn those locators off, come back on over here and cycle back on through here so you can see the rest of this. And there's also a material tag, and this is an important one to articulate. If, you're, if you have an entirely procedural mesh, you can't just hit the M key uh, to set material because there's really no geometry for you to set there. And so you add an item, and that would be underneath polygon material tag to the top of the stack. You set its material name. And if that material is in the shader tree, it's automatically going to be applied. Now, if you want to continue modifying a mesh. Um, we'll talk about some of these aspects, being able to export via FBX, things of that sort, right? Um, I can select my polys, come over into the item list just because I can say Control-C, and for a new mesh item, Control-V. And now this is a mesh that is entirely editable with our direct modeling tools. And so it's very easy to take a procedural mesh and preserve a procedural mesh in a way that um, lets you continue manipulating, right? All right, so last thing I want to show you procedural-wise is this gear. It's a basic, simple gear made by William Vaughn. It's awesome. He's got these preset controls in the viewport that I can manipulate the size, shape, number of uh, threads, teeth, yeah, they're called teeth, right, or a thickness of an item. Um, so very, very cool, very practical, very useful, and a good example of, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the areas where procedural modeling is really useful. Um, but I thought this was super cool, how flexible the procedural modeling system is. And if you'll notice, I've got a solver here. And the reason for that is you can see that I've got a rigid dynamic uh, body here for the actual gear itself. And for the plane, I've got a rigid static body that I can play around with. And if I go ahead and pop open my timeline and I press play, there we go. My gear is actually interacting with the scene well. And actually, I mean, very well considering that's more or less how I would expect something of those dimensions and that material to be manipulated. Now if I go ahead and I duplicate my procedural mesh item and then I pop on in there, I probably want to, in this case, I will move this item out of the way. And now I can go ahead and continue manipulating this and nothing happens even though it actually has dynamics on it. So it's something important to understand. You can come to dynamics and remove dynamics, come into my scene and setup tools and dynamics and say, <clears throat> excuse me, I want this to be an active rigid body as well. And underneath dynamic options, it doesn't do it by default. You're going to actually have to tell it, you know what, I probably want multi hole I don't want it to be static, and I want my margin to be one millimeter because I like that to be small and low. And you can see now these two meshes are interacting with each other beautifully. And if I wanted to, I could still use the same controller to manipulate these 
and modify, say for instance, the thickness. And of course, this is uh, dramatically affecting the mass of the items. And you see how differently they actually interact with each other. And so extremely cool that you're able to you know, adjust meshes on the fly and run dynamic simulations with them. This is something I'm hoping to take greater advantage of uh, in my Seagraph demo that I'm, I'm currently working on and looking forward to getting back to today. Um, but how cool is that, that you can actually just so quickly and so easily just modify an object and have it update for you. And so it's one of those moments where you just have to say, thank you, Matt Cox, for making such a flexible system that you know, behaves in ways that maybe you'd expect it to, but if you have experience in 3D, you probably don't expect it to because it usually doesn't work out this way. But that is super, super awesomely, extremely cool. All right, thank you so much for watching, guys, and uh, hopefully these webinars are useful to you. Um, this is something that we're working very, very hard on, and certainly say thank you to Janiya and, uh, and Emma and everybody for, for putting these together because we need to do more of this. Very exciting stuff. Have a good day.